me. Well, we're on week two of our series on the arrival of the Messiah, the arrival of the Messiah. And last week we talked about the prophecies of Jesus' birth, the, the situations, the circumstances around his birth, the place of his birth, and the family that he was born to, right? And we said just these alone are enough to prove he's the Messiah, but today we're going to look at actually how the life of Christ proves that he's the Messiah, how the life of Christ proves he's the Messiah. And uh, we're going to look at prophecies this week. We're going to look at prophecies next week. How many of you know prophecies are, prophecies are important, right? What are prophecies? They're written in the Old Testament about the coming Messiah, the Savior of the world. And so in Luke, when you read, hey, born to you to this day, is the Savior, the Messiah, we recognize that Jesus has actual, has been prepared for him to come. And we're going to look at these proofs of why we believe Jesus is the Messiah. How many of you want to know what you believe? Amen. Right? I know that there's some, there's some just believing and faith involved, you know, uh, but we need to know as much as we can of why we believe what we believe and what we say is true is true. And we base that here at Crossroads on the Word of God. And, uh, you know, we're going to look at the life of Christ uh, today more specifically because how many of you know the life of Christ? It would take an entire series, probably, we could probably talk all year about the Messianic prophecies that were fulfilled in his life, the little things that he did that the Old Testament said the Messiah would do, and so we're going to actually kind of whittle it down a little bit, and we're just going to look more specifically at the sufferings of Christ. Yay, that's a great Christmas message, isn't it? But how many of you know that Christ suffered, right? And that life is tough. Do you know that? Life is tough, isn't it? But, but here's an awesome thing is no matter how tough life gets, Jesus can relate. No matter what you're going through, Jesus can relate with you. I believe that everybody in the world would just about. Now, almost everybody here would say that life is tough. That bad stuff still happens to good people, right? Accidents still happen. In fact, my family and I we were rear-ended a few months ago. It still happens. Now, there's some people who'd say, well, you're just not a good enough believer, Ben, because, you know, if you were praying, the Lord would have protected your car from being rear-ended. And I say hogwash, all right? There's just bad stuff happens. It's a spillover effect. We still get colds. We still get sicknesses. It still affects our world. It doesn't mean that you're a bad Christian because bad things happen or because you experience suffering. It just means you're breathing. We still have difficult times. We still lose loved ones. In fact, when we were singing that last song, that was one of my father's favorite songs, Word of God Speak. And as I was singing it, I had memories of him coming back. The holidays can be a difficult time because we have those memories of our loved ones that have gone on to be with the Lord. And we sing songs that remind us of them. We uh, do things like candlelight services that as a child growing up, that's what my family did on Christmas Eve. But it brings back good memories. And here's the truth. The truth is that Christmas is a very emotional time. You probably heard that when you asked what their favorite movie is. You know, some people are like me and you, you prefer Griswold's Christmas Vacation. Now, I'm not endorsing the movie, all right? Watch it with the sound off. That would be a good idea. You'll laugh just as hard. All right. Um, but then other people are like Miracle on 34th Street or whatever it is. Or, you know, I'm dreaming of a white Christmas. Whatever your favorite. Christmas time, our emotion. If it weren't true, we wouldn't have the Hallmark Channel. <laughs> I was at dinner with a group of people the other night, and they told me they, they educated me on the Hallmark Channel. We don't have TV, so I don't know. They said there's actually three Hallmark channels. Yes, I was like, what? Is there enough Kleenex in your house for three Hallmark <laughs> channels, right? <laughs> I, I cry enough when I watch Elf, you know, but <laughs> Christmas is an emotional time. It's because it's a time of deep reflection. Right. You know, the, these memories, they flood our minds. I think about times I spend with my grandparents' house. <laughs> My grandma was a tough lady, man. She was awesome, but she was tough. You know, there was no ADD when I was growing up. It was just grandma gets a belt. She don't even take it to dad. She just, you know. <laughs> but these are memories that I wrestle with every single Christmas season. 
and, 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 you know, hold on to the good, but look to the future because the best is yet to come. Create new memories. And for many of us, this is exactly why Christmas is emotional. And it's a time to reflect on Jesus and what he did for us, for all mankind. The true meaning of Christmas is Jesus Christ. It's a celebration of his birth. And here is something for you to understand is that the holidays are a great time to minister to people for exact reasons what I just said. Christmas is an emotional time. That means there's a lot of people who need to be ministered to. People who are sad. People who miss loved ones. People who might not have family around. It's a great time to minister to people. Since Christmas is all about Jesus and teach us, Jesus teaches us it was more blessed to give than to receive, we should be the ones that are the most giving in this entire world. Show them the love of God in a practical way. Do kind acts. You know, my wife and I were driving home last night after shopping and um, not shopping for Christmas presents, shopping for donuts that you ate this morning. And, and we're driving down the road and all of a sudden the guy flies by us and he just shot. I'm not even going to tell you what he shouted, but he shouted out his window. And I was like, what was that about? And she's like, I don't know. He started flashing his light, so I pulled over. And I guess I wasn't driving fast enough for him. And I'm like, we're at a stoplight. <laughs> you know? As, as emotional as it is, some people don't always let it out in the greatest way. They don't show the love of Christ. And so guess who gets to do that? You and I, the people that love the Lord. And since the Holy Spirit lives in us, we take Him everywhere we go. So you should be the hope of the world. Our mission this Christmas should be to make Jesus famous. And you're, I know what you're saying. Well, that's good for you because you're a pastor, Ben. Well, actually, I just need to remind you of something that my job is actually to equip you and your job is to go out those doors and to reach out to your neighbors and your coworkers and your friends and your children and everybody else with the love of God. Because every member is a minister. Amen. You know, we use this word minister. We think it's something fancy, you know, like you got to wear a, a sharp looking suit and stand on a stage. That's not true. That's what a teacher does. That's what a pastor does. But everybody that belongs to the body of Christ is a minister. We're called to minister. Well, you, you want proof? Okay, I'll give you proof. Romans 12, 4 to 6. Just as our bodies have many parts and each part has a special function, so it is with Christ's body. How many of you are getting sick of hearing this, right? This comes out at least once a month. I know. We had a whole series on it. But hey, I saved the best and, uh, for each week. Each part has a special function, so it is with Christ's body. We are many parts of one body. Everybody say one body. And we all belong to each other. In His grace, God has given us different gifts for doing certain things well. So if God has given you the ability to prophesy, speak out with as much faith as God has given you. See, we are all called to the ministry because God has given us all a special gift. You're a minister. And some of you are like, oh boy. <laughs> You're a minister. Amen. If you've accepted the Lord as your personal Savior, if you said, Jesus, I have sinned, I am sorry, forgive me. That makes you a minister. It doesn't matter if you've been a Christian for a hundred years or if you just said that when you saw my jacket, you had to repent, all right? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how long you've been a Christian, you're a minister. You might say, well, I don't know what to say. Well, you don't have to necessarily say anything at all. Just be kind, just be nice. Just uh, whatever you want to do, usually do the opposite and you'll be all right. Life is tough. Amen. And the holidays are tough for a lot of people. It's a great opportunity to minister. And, and here is kind of the main theme of this day. It's that people often equate pain and suffering in this life with the consequences for their sin. Now I want to talk to you about this for, with this for a second. Isaiah 53, did you catch that part where it said, we thought that his death was a result of his own sin. But it wasn't. He bore our sins. Like he took our sins away. There is a group of people who believe only time bad things happen are when you sin. It's not true. The world has been infected with sin. It's everywhere. It's all over the place. 
Okay? And it, in, it, it affects everyone. It does. And so it's not, not just because, you know, you sin that you get a cold. Some people are like, oh, give me an example. Okay, I'm glad you asked for an example. John chapter 9. There's a man that the Bible says was born blind. No one could help him. Jesus walks by. He spits on the ground, rubs some mud together. Now, how many of you be like, I'm not letting him put that anywhere near me. And he puts it on the guy's eyes and he says, now go wash yourself in the pool of Salaam. And in verse 34, something that the religious leaders say is very interesting to me. They're talking to this man that was blind that Jesus healed because when he washed, he, was, he could see. He's like, well, I don't know, I can't explain it. So they bring him before the religious leaders. They ask him all these questions and he's like, well, listen, you can think what you want to think and I'm going to think what happened to me. And this dude walked by and he spit and he rubbed his dirt together. He rubbed it on my eyes and I all, now I can see. No one else could do that for me. So where do you think he came from? He's the son of God. <laughs> That's what the guy says. But in verse 34, they say something very interesting. The religious leaders of the day. They say, you were born a total sinner. See, but the religious leaders weren't saying everybody's born as a sin nature. The religious leaders are saying, you were born a sinner because you were blind. They thought that, that physical handicaps were actually a sin. And they're not. They're not. It's a result of sin being in the world. That messes with our DNA. That messes with our physical bodies, with our health. But it wasn't a sin for the man to be born blind. He had no control over it. They said, well, who sinned, this man or his parents, his disciples? Jesus' friends asked him this. And I'm sure the Pharisees would have been like blaming everybody but themselves. And Jesus is like, don't, you don't understand. Neither this man nor his parents sinned. Go read the story later. See, because we all deal with the consequences of the collateral damage that sin has caused. But here's an awesome truth, Hebrews 4.15. This high priest, Jesus, of ours, understands our weaknesses, for he faced all the same testings we do, yet he did not sin. Jesus was perfect. That's how he could take away our sins. That's how he, he earned the right to forgive us of our sins. He was the payment of our sins. He endured all that we face, the emotional pain, the physical pain, the temptations that we face. No matter what you're going through, Jesus understands. Amen. That's why he's such a great friend. That's why it's always a good idea to talk to him before you talk to anybody else. He's been through it. He's faced the same, and he's actually faced worse. First Peter 18, 19. For you know that God paid a ransom to save you from the empty life. Everybody say empty life. Yeah. You inherited. How many of you remember before you, before you were really sold out to the Lord? Like before you became a Christian, before you were really, really pursuing God. How many of you remember that? I just remember my life being empty. I really do. Sin. You know, it, it was just, it was empty. I pursued happiness through a bottle. I hung out with my friends late at night, did stupid things. I mean, it was empty. Yeah. And so many people are searching for the solution to the emptiness of this life. It says, the empty life you inherited from your ancestors, and it was not paid with mere gold or silver, which lose their value. It was the precious blood of Christ, the sinless, spotless Lamb of God. Jesus paid for all of our sin. Jesus pray, paid for all of our sickness. He paid for it all. He endured it all. In fact, Jesus' life was full of painful events that actually show he was the Messiah. His life was full of painful events. There's people who teach this idea that your life should be all roses once you come to the Lord. And there's some truth to that. Paul says you should be content in all situations. Whether you have a lot or whether you have nothing. Find a way to be content. Paul says, I can be in prison and I'm happy. I can be free man and I'm happy. It doesn't matter because my happiness is not contingent upon my circumstances. It's contingent upon me knowing Jesus as my Lord and Savior. So there is some aspect of being fulfilled and happy just by knowing the Lord as your Savior. But anyone who says that life is not going to be painful when you're a believer has never studied the life of Christ. 
What are some of these things, some of these Old Testament prophecies that actually show that Jesus is the Messiah? The first one is this, the Messiah was to be rejected. Isaiah 53, 1 to 30, I'm going to read verse 3. It says, He was despised and rejected, a man of sorrows, acquitted with the deepest grief. He turned our backs, we turned our backs on him and he looked the other way. He was despised and we did not care. And then John 1, 10 to 11 actually is the fulfillment of this. He came into this very world he created. Isn't that interesting? Anybody who doubts that Jesus is God, right? Who created the world? God, right? And, and who is he talking about here? Jesus. Jesus is God. If you read an elementary reading of the Bible in the New Testament, you'll see that Jesus is God in flesh, which is what Christmas is. It's celebrating God being born in flesh. He came into the very world he created, but the world did not recognize him. He came to his own people, and even they rejected him. See, Jesus was rejected. John 12, 37 and 38. But despite all the miraculous signs, you would think that Jesus, when he turns water into wine, when he heals the blind man, when he feeds over 5,000 people, you think they'd get the idea, right? Like, you know, he'd be on the TV somewhere. You know, he'd, have, he'd have his own channel, right? I mean, if Oprah Winfrey has her own TV channel now, Jesus would have been like, you know, you would think, but he wasn't here to do that. He was here to fulfill his destiny, which was to be the Messiah. But despite all the miraculous signs Jesus had done, most of the people still did not believe in him. This is exactly what Isaiah the prophet had predicted. Lord, who has believed our message? To whom has the Lord revealed his powerful arm? And then Matthew 26, 3 and 4. At the same time, the leading priests and elders were meeting at the resident of Caiaphas. Ky Caiaphas, yeah. I've been to his house. I just have a hard time pronouncing his name. Caiaphas, yeah, yeah. The high priest plotting on how to capture Jesus secretly and kill him. He was abandoned. He was betrayed. Psalm 41, 9. It says, Even my best friend, the one I trusted completely, the one who shared my food has turned against me. The Last Supper, right? When Jesus is sharing food with his disciples. Psalm 55, 12 and 13. It is not an enemy who taunts me. I could bear that. It is not my foes who so arrogantly insult me. I could have hidden from them. Instead, it is you, my equal, my companion, and close friend. Jesus was deserted. He was betrayed by his closest friends. Matthew 26, 47 to 50. And even as Jesus said this, Judas, one of the 12 disciples, arrived with a crowd of men armed with swords and clubs. They had been sent by the leading priests and elders of the people. The traitor Judas had given them a prearranged signal. You will know the one to arrest when I greet him with a kiss. So Judas came straight to Jesus, greeting Rabbi, he exclaimed, exclaimed, and gave him the kiss. Jesus said, my friend, go ahead and do what you have come for. Then the others grabbed Jesus and arrested him. But here at this table, sitting among us, is a friend, as a friend, is the man who will betray me. For it is written, it has been determined that the Son of Man must die. But what sorrow awaits the one who betrays? Jesus was betrayed. Jesus was also mistreated. Isaiah 53, 7. He was oppressed, mistreated. He was oppressed and treated harshly, yet he never said a word. He was like a lamb, led uh, like a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep is silent before the shears, he did not open his mouth. Verse 8, unjustly condemned, he was led away. No one cared that he died without descendants, that his life was cut short in midstream, but he was struck down for the rebellion of my people. 
And then in Matthew 7, verse 12, we see the fulfillment of this prophecy when it says, but when the leading priests and elders made their accusations against him, Jesus remained silent. I think this is really interesting because it's the only time in Scripture where I see Jesus remaining silent. All the other times, these dudes, these smart, educated hypocrites... (laughs) He always shows him the truth. He's like, uh, let me tell you what the scriptures say, actually. Oh, you're in error. This is what it says. In fact, you're, you are just a brood of snakes. You guys are all wrong. I mean, Jesus is constantly correcting him. But when it comes to the end of his life, Jesus sits there and he closes his mouth. And they say, well, you did this and you did that and you're guilty and you're a thief and you're a liar and... He just remained silent. This happened to fulfill the prophecy that was written hundreds of years beforehand. Jesus was mistreated and Jesus was abandoned. He was abandoned. Psalm 31, 11 says, I am scorned by all my enemies and despised by my neighbors. Even my closest friends are afraid to come near me. When they see me on the streets, they run the other way. Now, here's the deal. I wasn't 100% sold on this because this is David talking, and David could be talking about his own situation, right? David's running. He's afraid. He's writing. There's There's some messianic prophecies that it's hard to differentiate between the author and what they're talking about. And so I wasn't completely sold on this, so I went ahead and I found another one that talked about this. Zechariah 13, 7, Awake, O sword, against my shepherd, the man who is my partner, says the Lord of heaven's armies. Strike down the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered, and I will turn against the lambs. Perfect description, written hundreds of years before the life of Christ, of what would happen when Jesus was arrested. His friends would just scatter. They would scatter, just like the word said. Oh. Mark fourteen fifty. Then all the disciples deserted him and ran away. Do you see the connections here between the Messiah promised in the Old Testament and the life of Christ himself? Jesus suffered. Jesus endured. He was abandoned. He was mistreated. He was abused. And uh, he did this so that we could be healed, so we could receive salvation. Thank you. And the truth is, is that the world is full of hurting people. The world's full of hurting hurting people. And it's your job and my job to do the best we can to help those hurting people. Ultimately, it's Jesus that will heal them. Hebrews 13, 16, And don't forget to do good and share with those in need. These are the sacrifices that please God. I mean, this is awesome. We're talking about Christmas where it's all about giving. We serve a God who gave His one and only Son that whosoever believeth in Him would not perish but have everlasting life. Christmas is about giving. In Acts, they say that that Jesus taught Him it's more blessed to give than to receive. And this is a great time of the year for you to share with those in need. Now here's the deal. It's not always a financial need. It's not always something you can buy. Sometimes it's spending time with someone who needs a friend. It's listening to someone who needs to share. It's hugging someone who needs a hug. It's being there and it's ministering to them. James 2, 14 to 17. What good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith, but don't show it by your actions? Let's not be those people that when we go to work and we tell them we're Christians, everybody's surprised. (laughs) We've all been there, right? Someone's like, I love Jesus. And you're like, really? I thought you only loved yourself. No, you never say that, right? But we all have met those people. Let's not be them this holiday season. If we say we have faith, let's show it through our actions. Can this kind of faith save anyone? Suppose you see a brother or sister who has no food or clothing, and you say goodbye and have a good day, stay warm and eat well. But then you don't give that person any food or clothing. What good does that do? 
So you see, faith by itself isn't enough unless it produces good deeds. It is dead and useless. You know, I think we're always afraid that we don't have the answer. And you know, the Lord has kind of showed me over the years. It's not always about being the answer. It's just about being available. Amen. And you might not have what they need, but you can listen to them. You can pray for them. Maybe you can meet the need. Maybe they'll say something you'll be like, that's so weird because I have that in storage and it's been there for like 15 years. You know? But take the time because people matter. And every person deserves an opportunity to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Let's be a church that's full of living faith. Full of doing faith. Let's be a church of action, not a church that sits inside a building, complains about the temperature, the, the level of the music. The, I mean, all those things, they, they kind of matter to a point. But what is it really about? It's about going and doing good. It's about going and sharing with the world the hope of Jesus Christ. Leviticus 19, 9 to 10 says it like this. When you harvest the crops of your land, do not harvest the grain along the edges of your fields and do not pick up what the harvesters drop. It's the same with your grape crop. Do not strip every last bunch of grapes from the vines and do not pick up the grapes that fall to the ground. Leave them for the poor and the foreigners living among you. I am the Lord, your God. And don't fire the dude that drops a little bit of, of, of harvest either. Let's treat people well. I want to speak to that for a second because I know there's business owners in here and I'm not saying that you never have to fire someone because we all know that there's times where you have to. But I want to ask you a question. And it's, re it's re revolving around this idea of someone dropping the harvest. It says, don't pick that up. Don't regather that and take it. Just, just leave it for the other people who need, right? So, should we be mad if an accident happens and a little bit of the crop drops to the ground? Because some of us get furious. We're like, this person's always doing this. Blah, 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 blah. But the end result was that someone in need received. Amen. Right? Amen. And there's times, I'm sure, where the Lord had planned and purposed where every crop would be dropped. So this Christmas season, let's celebrate Jesus by sharing our faith in action. Mother Teresa I'm a fan, by the way, if you want to know. Mother Teresa said, faith in action is love. And love in action is service. By transforming faith into, the li to, into living acts of love, we put ourselves in contact with God himself, with Jesus, our Lord. Amen. We're not talking about earning our salvation here. We're talking about a living act of faith on purpose to be the body of Christ that the world needs to give hope that the people of the world need to receive. Amen? Amen. Let's pray.